Welcome to the sixth annual Lexus and Whitewall Art and Design Innovation Series here at Design Miami. We're thrilled to be here today discussing design impact, creating for a more sustainable future. Today we'll go beyond the buzzword of sustainability to learn how architects, artists, and designers are thinking about their impact on their community, environment, and future. I'm thrilled to be joined today by our panelists, uh, Dror Benchatrit, Harry Nuriev, Archana Menon, and Thomas Koldafi. And we will have the moderator, Alessandro Passati, as well. Artist designer and inventor Dror Benchatrit has an award-winning portfolio of product design, architecture, and city planning projects and has exhibited internationally. He is the founder of Super Nature Labs, which is pioneering new models for the urban environment in which architecture and infrastructure work harmoniously with nature. Harry Nuriev is an artist, architect, furniture designer, and the founder and creative director of Crosby Studios, an interior architecture and design firm established in Moscow in 2014 with outposts in New York and Paris. Nuriev's creative practice span a broad range of typologies, including public spaces, private residences, retail stores, product design, fashion, and art collaborations. And just around the corner, you'll see his work at the Design Curio here. And be sure to jump in. It's good uh, for a picture and to experience. Archana Menon is an Indian architect and designer based in Savannah, where she is currently getting her MFA in furniture design at SCAD. The founder of Primal Forms, her training as an architect frames the way she thinks about furniture, especially in her approach to materials. Her practice combines current manufacturing technologies with craft techniques, and she's also showing here today at Design Miami with SCAD. Thomas Koldafi is an architect and principal of Koldafi uh, Studio. Based in France and working internationally, the studio creates balanced environmental, urban, and social compositions that push boundaries of cities and life weaving landscape and personal narratives in projects such as the National Pulse Memorial and Museum in Orlando or Tropicalia, the giant greenhouse in the north of France. And today we'll have Alex Passati moderating. He is the founder and director of the nonprofit cultural organization Zweka Projects. As a cultural practitioner, he's collaborated with institutions like the Guggenheim Foundation, Chicago Architecture Biennial, and the Venice Biennale. Uh, with Zweka Projects, he's organized projects with international artists like Ai Weiwei, Marina Abramovic, Jürgen Teller, uh, Koldafi Architects, and the estate of Christo and Jean-Claude. So I will leave you for the discussion. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. And thank you to our moderators. Uh, fantastic cross-disciplinary examples of how impact can be approached in the creative sphere. Uh, everybody has very exciting projects ongoing at the moment, some here at the fair. Uh, we take a minute to explore what everybody is up to and tell us a bit about your current practice. Harry, can you tell us something about your project here? Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, r right around the corner next door, we have our booth. It's our uh, sixth booth at Design Miami. We're so proud to be here. Every, every industry in the world, the fashion, art, uh, culture education they have millions of different events all over you know the year and we only have a couple of it and it's one of them and I'm so proud of to be all of here and combine uh, in one week in one room and to see each other uh, in real life look at each other eyes um, our projects is um, called the bedroom you should all go if you have a chance to look at it and Take your shoes off and jump on and feel, and I'll tell you in person what it's about. It's like a playground. It's like a, it feels like a very playful for adult. For a playground for adults, somewhere yeah. you can get lost and forget. You know, you are here to work or not, and really <laughs> reconnect with your child. Or, you know, exactly. Your child, right. Perfect. And there's a material which you use specifically. Uh, that's the eco leather, so it's, it looks like a mirror, but it's almost like a liquid so the material. Fabric. Yeah, that's the fabric and um, the whole thing. And we have this digital uh, light ceiling that changed the color instantly that remind, um, reflect an idea of uh, sunset. So it's you a guys- It's multimedia video, which is in transformation. That's a digital- Kinda, yeah. Uh, Drawer, you just premiered a fantastic new, new project. Uh, Drawer premiered Super Nature Labs. 
brand new project of which we know not so much about. Jor's incredible practice stems from urban centers uh, to re-imagining uh, how really um, civic living can, can exist today. What can you tell us about Supernature Labs? So yeah, um, a little bit before Supernature Labs, um, I've always cared about creativities without boundaries. Uh, for me, design is not necessarily binded by the academic disciplines that we study. I was always interested actually more in the intersections between disciplines. Um, so my practice for the last 20 years have worked on rethinking design typologies, um, you know, from furniture pieces all the way up to large urban planning uh, projects. About four years ago, I was really starting to get very concerned about the future of our planet and really thinking that it's maybe a time to stop thinking about just the projects that we can get as a practice, but really start thinking what does the world needs the most. Um, and it was really clear to me that the future of urbanism is the most important thing for us to focus on. Uh, so we started Supernature Labs with the intention to think about innovation that um, are in the intersection between infrastructure and structures. Um, roll down four years, we just now starting to debut the work that we've been focusing on. And um, at the core, uh, maybe I'll talk a bit more about that later, but it's really at the core of what we do is a completely new approach for urban planning uh, practices. So what we call bioplanning is uh, based on non-Cartesian logic. It's basically based on cellular logic. Uh, so if you look at absolutely everything in nature, everything is organized in cell formation. Uh, so why are we not organizing communities in a similar way? Uh, and once we started exploring that approach, we realized that there are enormous amount of benefits such as massive reduction of infrastructure needs, massive reductions in roads, um, massive increase in green spaces, uh, massive improvements on people's well-being, and actually we can achieve all of that by creating a much lower construction costs and, uh, and much faster construction. So that's currently the, the main focus. Thank you, and we'll talk a bit more about that later. Uh, Thomas Caldefi of Caldefi Architects, uh, based in France, uh, has a practice which stands also uh, integration of sustainability nature in urban cityscape. Uh, you just presented the world's largest tropical greenhouse at the Venice Architecture Biennial. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that and about what you're working on at the moment? Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Thomas. I'm a, so I'm an architect. Uh, working from my main studio based in Paris, Lille, I also have an office in Shanghai. Uh, the main questions uh, and the main reason I'm here is to talk about the project that we do uh, in, uh, that was exhibited at the latest uh, biennial in, in Venice. It's uh, Tropical Dome, it will be la the largest uh, tropical dome in the world. It's 20,000 square meter uh, autonomous building, so it's not only about the size, it's also about the role of architecture, uh, which I strongly uh, believe and focus today, on how uh, architecture can go beyond simple objects of beauty, but also produce energy and act as an energy generator. Uh, I'm also working on the, the theme of uh, community. Uh, the, yesterday, actually, a friend of uh, Alessandro asked me if I could summarize uh, uh, the architecture that we do in one word, which is quite difficult uh, because architecture is very uh, sophisticated. And I, just 30 seconds, I chose the word uh, people. Uh, people. I think today uh, our challenge is, uh, uh, is about also making community places. That's what I'm doing currently here in Florida. I'm uh, designing uh, the museum and the memorial uh, that will be taking place after the uh, attacks uh, of uh, this uh, LGBT uh, nightclub that happened here in Orlando. And we are really working on how uh, we can heal the city uh, through uh, architectural interventions 
that are touching the feelings of people, but also uh, creating some better uh, interaction uh, into some uh, old-fashioned city grids, such as the south of downtown of Orlando. So we do that through, uh, like Drew was saying, uh, uh, breaking the bridges between architecture, design, art, and landscape. Uh, that would be my uh, focus on the next years. Thank you, Toma. And we have Arjuna, uh, your company, Primal Design. Could you tell us about what's being shown here in Miami? Uh, firstly, hi, everyone. It's an incredible honor to be uh, sharing this platform with all of you here. And thank you so much for inviting me uh, to this discussion. I, my practice is actually at a very nascent stage right now because I'm currently in graduate school um, at SCAD. I'm studying furniture design. Um, uh, but prior to that, I worked as an architect for a few years in India. And um, so at the very beginning of my professional practice as an architect, I sort of wanted to make a conscious effort to like acquaint myself with uh, alternative construction technologies and earth-based um, practices. Um, so that kind of laid the foundation for me uh, as to think about um, how it's important to uh, really uh, question the basic constraints of how we build and what are the subsequent impacts of the choices that we make. So my training as an architect really laid the foundation for me, uh, for my practice as a furniture designer. So talking about the collection that's displayed here at Design Miami, it's part of my thesis collection that I've been working on and it's called Primal Forms. So the whole idea behind the collection was uh, to really uh, deconstruct some of the furniture archetypes that we are so accustomed to and really steer away from the throwaway culture that we are um, you know, seeing lately in the furniture industry and create furniture that has a quality of permanence to it because I think sustainability, when we talk about that, it's important that we build things that last and you know, that has a quality of permanence. So that's the whole thesis. What is it about? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so we're discussing impact, and impact can take on many forms that we discussed. There's a sustainable in materials, choice of materials, and impact on community, people. Uh, obviously, we're dealing here with different spheres, from the macro of architecture, city planning, the very macro, individual buildings, and then the more uh, microcosmic, which is related to the individual people. Uh, Harry, uh, you, you have a horseshoe theory of design, and is, how, how, is this something that, you know, how does this influence your creative process? What role does impact have in your creative process uh, when you're approaching a new project, a product? Uh, at what point, you know, how do you engage with this and, and what is maybe the outcome you're going for? Sustainability for us is um, actually a very fun process. It's, it's not just uh, some sort of uh, lips over. We really, really enjoy to um, work on that. N not even because it's trained or something. It's just really fun to... Uh, bring things that already exist in to and give them second life. It's you feel very proud of it when you do it. You feel something um, important inside. And uh, last two years ago, we did projects here in, in the same pavilion with um, one f uh, fashion brand, um, and we're just rethinking how we can use their source of materials and uh, garments and. Um, and bring it to such a um, prestige design fair and show the beauty of, of garbage, a thing that could go to, you know, in, I don't know, in a burn factory or in trash or just forever disappear in your closet. And um, the idea behind this project was to show younger designer, all, all the designer in our community that you don't have to um, hesitate or shy to not just to bring the subject but show the beauty of actual true recycled thing without trying to cover in and with beautiful color and a beautiful surface but uh, because I think nature language very close to 
um, uh, language of recycle because there is something of recycle, the season recycle, the, you know, day, night, and all this thing together. It's very natural, and you don't even have to. It's pretty effortless almost to um, uh, to to work in this field. And when you bring in beautiful shape and function, it just turns into a different level. And interesting how people react on it too. It's completely different. I think. Uh, each of us feeling inside that it's important before we're thinking about beauty or color or I don't know function and that's what makes this thing beautiful and we really excited to continue work in this field and other brands and other people uh, private clients now we have this virtual um, parallel world where without any construction and um, vinyl and plastic we can create a whole new uh, thing it's I think it's a different panel we shouldn't talk about right now but yeah that's overall the, the metaverse yeah that's the metaverse uh, yeah I don't want to mention it but true. we're still here on this plane of existence so repurposing and the emotional connection that we have with that process and giving nobility no, and, and bringing back a human feeling and emotion to things which we've discarded and we've forgotten and we can give a new, to it a new meaning. Um, drawer, how do you approach and at what point and at what stage uh, the impact uh, uh, within the project? I mean, you, you've given a pretty, a very broad and specific at the same time uh, presentation initially, uh, but specifically when you get a new commission, uh, supposedly, the role of impact is is therefore at what stage is it the very you know at what stage of your creative process and in terms of output and outcome what are your expectations yeah um, it's a bit of a it's a it's a really interesting question because I think that um, I don't see sustainability as a chip that sits on our shoulder that we need to kind of like be reminded by and kind of pay attention to in an artificial way, right? Like when you really think about the type of experience that you want to create, especially with architecture, especially when you're thinking of, you know, the built environment, um, essentially it directly relates to the type of experience that you create and through that experience how people behave. Um, so I think that when you think of human behavior in terms of design, um, it's very it, it's very much a part of you know being connected to things that matters, being connected to values, being connected to you know integrity, um, and I think that when those things are in your core motivation, your project by nature becomes a lot more sustainable than not paying attention to those things. So for us, obviously, it's been the main focus for the last four years um, to really think about, to, I, I call it kind of go beyond sustainability, really thinking about the future of ecological harmony. How do we get ourselves into a stage that we live in harmony? And I think that for us, harmony relates to one, harmony with ourselves, harmony with other people, and then harmony with the environment. So, you know, yeah, it's, it, it's kind of, I feel, you know, integrated. But of course, when you're thinking of, of let's say, a product design commission, let's say, and that, you know, you have a certain idea that is not part of your mandate of, you know, ecological harmony, I still think that when you are kind of promoting this type of well-being in terms of experience, all of a sudden you realize that non-natural materials are just, you know, not the right thing to do or certain processes that are not, you know, uh, so sustainable in nature, they're not, they're, they just don't belong. So, so in, the, in the process, it's a natural selection based on a philosophy and a DNA of, a, of a exactly. interpreting a solution or, or a project. Uh, Thomas, obviously in buildings uh, you have a lot of constraints, restraints and clients are often maybe, you know, what is your experience and approach? 
Yeah. Uh, for architecture, uh, there is a sense of responsibility for the, the, the role of the architect today and tomorrow. Uh, because the, the, the minute you start to design and you use materials, uh, you can consider that you start polluting uh, the environment. Uh, so today's uh, my role and the role of uh, uh, designers, I think we are all the same page, is about uh, uh, how to, um, I mean, on my side, I would approach this world of sustainability with two aspects. The first aspect is what I call going back to the basics it's not about uh, technology and the second aspect is technology uh, but it comes it goes after because for the first one uh, what i call going back to the basics is about asking myself and ourselves uh, the questions uh, is what is it that we need today and uh, what is it that we want actually and uh, if you start uh, putting that layer on the first step of the commission you receive uh, you start to uh, highlight uh, things that are not only about ecology, it's also about happiness, it's also about bringing people together, it's also about uh, making a city uh, healthier uh, by bringing the nature in. And uh, what I like about the single aspect is about using technology, which is a, a tool, uh, which is not something that will, I will play with my heart, but I will play with the tools that we have uh, which is actually uh, almost an infinity today of possibilities. Uh, today, uh, when we build, we are not like uh, expecting when are we going to find the new materials that will be uh, actually uh, the best one to use for this building. We, we would tailor-made uh, architecture and design by playing with data and parameters in order to pick the right material uh, at the right place, uh, put it... Uh, uh, I mean, for example, if I use the example of Tropicalia that I would be happy to, to share with you, is, uh, is how to bring light inside the dome. Uh, so it has to be a place as much transparent as possible. Also, how to make a place that is super insulated. So for this project, I will use ETFE, which is a membrane uh, that I use as an air chamber, actually, to give some more insulation for inside but also to, uh, to keep the air uh, inside almost like the air chamber of a bicycle. Uh, you stock the air inside by just by using solar energy and you're able to produce energy uh, for the entire uh, uh, interior space. So it's about, uh, uh, as I was saying, responsibility. It's, uh, we are at Design Miami and the world design is not enough. Uh, I think it's a given. It's something that we, it's, we need to do as a first place to make places of beauty. Uh, but today and tomorrow is about making places that are uh, more coherent, coherent uh, with uh, their impact on the city and also with their impact on people. Uh, so maybe I'll say just a few words again about the uh, Orlando project, uh, just to uh, illustrate. Orlando project is a, it's a project that's super sensitive. Uh, it's touching uh, many, many people, many communities. Uh, so the world of sustainability goes beyond again we say it, uh, how are we going to what what are the medias that we're going to use to define a strategy uh, so we say we're going to use nature we're going to use art colors we're working with uh, an artist french artist xavier veillant and we're going to work with water because uh, water is a source of everything so it's a, it's a source of rehealing people but also the source of rehealing the city in order to grow plants and new plants in the city so those are the challenges that I'm, I'm, I'm really focusing and uh, uh, passionate about it. Thank you, Thomas. And Arjunan. Yeah, uh, for me personally, I'll try to look at furniture the same way as I would look at an architectural project, I think, because it, the, in terms of the design language, irrespective of the scale, um, I think the concept behind every project and the end goal is the same, I feel. Um, and also, I think that objects and materials that we surround ourselves with, the quality of it determines the quality of our experiences. So I think it's really important to uh, focus on how we build and really start to question the accepted ways of making things because uh, in, in, in the world that we see today, uh, a lot of you're surrounded with so many like multifunctionality and superfluous frills and all of those things. And 
maybe you know some uh, perhaps simplicity could be an answer to that and that could be more captivating so uh, when it comes to sustainability it's not really about uh, it's not about wanting more but wanting less but um, that's more important so so raising an awareness through you know subtraction rather than yeah. addition yeah uh, thank you, everybody, for an insight into the process uh, of making. Now we're going to look into you know, what the outcomes wished for you know, in the immediate and the future. So what kind of future do you see? What kind of outcomes you know, do you wish your products to bring? So this is like you've given us an introspective look of your approach to product and project making. And then, of course, what is the future you envisage? Uh, what role do you wish your, you know, projects you have and uh, what can you tell us about that harry future. future and meta maybe is your future i mean i think we really need to touch the you know the very bottom of when we uh, spend all our resource then we i think fully start to think about it but before it happened i think us designers and architects and artists we have to take the first responsibility for that and kind of incorporate this almost education uh, process of bringing uh, sustainability to the world and not try to hide it underneath again I already mentioned it underneath the beautiful uh, material surfaces but um, show the beauty of it so people will get used to of see I don't know almost a garbage t is how it could be in like an hour I don't know live in our kitchen or a bedroom in our closet or and hanging our wall. And I think that will be the start of sustainable uh, stream. Also technology today already, um, I think 80% um, allowed us to almost to build a building. So you can have 3D print building and every single cups and curtains could make out of plastic that was two months ago catching out of the sea. And uh, that's beautiful. Uh, so I think our uh, mission, it's not a directly answer for a question, you're talking about future, but I, I, I think that my answer is about a mission to uh, use this technology and show the people they're accessible um, and uh, use this platform such a design Miami and other fairs to share with people that it's not just some uh, concept that might in 10 or 15 years will be in the market but it's already here you can um, you can use it so we just have to talk about more I can't pr cannot predict future but uh, I think all we can do is just really share and um, with conservative environment that this is not shame to uh, reuse and give second life for something. And every time I want to make buy something new, we have to think twice, especially when it comes to furniture. I think Design Miami actually represent a really good uh, collective market with vintage furniture, which I think really beautiful. So that's let's just encourage it and. Um, and bring it to next level. Isn't an answer your question? Yeah, so a behavioral shift, which can be brought upon by technological innovation, application of methods, but as well, you know, reevaluating what we have already and giving new sense and purpose. Two years ago, I tried to find something and it didn't happen. Um, our sofa that we show here two years ago was covered by uh, Bob Film, which looks like a vinyl, but it's not vinyl. It's a biodegradable film that doesn't um, ex um, contain any PVC and again I don't think I could make the same project five years ago it's only it's only possible because this technology is existing and we found it just out of nowhere and basically Google it well the design and architecture there as a catalyst for innovation in technology so many of you through your research and your commission of you know through the necessity to solve problems, no, you, you're engaged in the development of these materials and techniques and technologies. So then there's an active component therein 
uh, which can be immediately applied. Is that correct? And um, in drawer, how about you? Yeah, I think um, for me, probably the most important um, stage in the process of creation is the first project, is the first phase, um, which for me is what I call the stage of dreaming. Um, you know, you often get like a certain brief with certain restrictions, with certain zoning limitations. Um, and I always try to pretty much ignore all of it for a short period of time at least uh, in order to really, really kind of just dream of what could possibly be the best outcome if you have no limitation whatsoever. Um, I think for me it's a very important stage of the project because then when you do get confronted by the limitation, you can find creative ways to potentially go around them. And I think that if you're immediately already like put walls against certain you know, possibilities, uh, you would never break out of those limitations. So for me, that's a very important part of the process. Um, in fact, two years ago, I put my first book with Monocelli Press, and it's called Draw Dream because, um, you know, some of the projects that we chose to publish are not necessarily completed projects, but projects that actually the conceptual integrity behind them is equally important than projects that are completed. So, yeah, dreaming phase, I guess, for me is a is an important phase. So dreaming the future, basically. Dreaming the future, yeah. Free of constraints, with the freedom of dream. When you, when you think of um, certain zoning limitations, right, in, in, in architecture and, and urban planning, I mean, some of those codes have been written like in the 60s and in the 70s, and a lot of them are just not relevant. And unfortunately, many architects and many urban planners are basically just taking them, you know, for, for what they are and saying, well, you know, the zoning said so. Well, who wrote those zoning? You know, somebody like me and you 40 years ago. So maybe it's time for us to, you know, fight for some changes and fight for some, you know, adaptation and, you know. Push the boundaries. Push the boundaries. Tamar, what does your future look like? Uh, yeah, I, I like this idea of pushing the boundaries also. Uh, so I would, I would say that uh, it's about uh, questioning also uh, the way we do things and the way we approach projects uh, from uh, a daily basis. Uh, I think the future is also going to be uh, very strong in about recycling. Uh, today we're recycling iPhones, but actually uh, there is a huge, a huge impact of uh, a capacity to transform existing buildings into a new function, a new era, which is making also the, the work as an architect uh, very interesting because uh, it's giving so many constraints, uh, but it's within those constraints that we are able to find something that is uh, 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 changing the, the city skyline and changing the habits of people. It's about provoking also the change by surprising. Uh, you cannot imagine if you look every day in the street uh, on a building, you think it's ugly, but actually uh, we can make something out of it just by using its uh, essential uh, um, skeleton or things that needs to be kept in order not to waste it. Uh, that would be one aspect that is uh, uh, very uh, challenging and I'll say also something about uh, dogmatism. I think it's about also breaking uh, uh, fake ideas of uh, uh, for the future we have to to build everything in wood or we have to bring uh, to stop building with concrete actually all those things are kind of a uh, almost like an organi organism and you play with those tools and the and with the resources that you have in a country uh, to find the best parameters and in the end you calculate what will be the carbon footprints by uh, uh, the ingredients almost like you do some cooking uh, so doesn't I think there is a tendency to accelerate this uh, thinking of uh, um, uh, any, everything needs to be uh, made out of wood, which is not the right solution, uh, straightforward. And uh, another thing that I'm uh, also interested in to 
So we have this chance to work, uh, to work internationally, to cross boundaries with different cultures, and uh, this is bringing so much. Uh, there is uh, a drawback to that, which is uh, globalization, and sometimes people uh, can fall into the idea that cities are losing some essence or some souls, uh, but I think it's also something that is belonging to the past and the future is more about uh, working together uh, to uh, uh, give, uh, I mean, I when I work in China, for example, I don't pretend that I, 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 know by, I know the history of China and I know the urban grid by heart, but I have a capacity to read it and to uh, bring new interpretation and collaborate with some uh, local uh, people uh, in order to work together. It's so I think the, the, we have passed this idea of colonization and we are going more into collaboration, uh, which is very interesting for uh, um, the bridge between people. So it's creating new friendships, new uh, professional experiences, and also bringing some more interesting buildings. So there is a community approach to problem solving and we envisage you know, the future together and sharing our experiences, know-hows, and visions, and, yeah. uh, you know, to create something unique and more evolved and elaborate in our Chenan. Yeah, I think, um, although design, as architects, designers, we do play a critical role in shaping the future of design, but there are far more important stakeholders in this entire ecosystem because uh, for a significant change to happen, I think there needs to be a reform in even government regulations and uh, even the choices that people make in terms of consumption and all of those things. So uh, for any change to happen, there needs to be a significant change at the top so that it trickles down at the grassroots level. Um, and um, I think the future of design has to be more inclusive and it needs to foster you know, heterogeneity of processes, ideas, cultures, um, and I think that's the way forward to, yeah. Can I just make a comment? Yes. You said something actually quite important. Um, you know, the, the, this aspect of importance, right? Like, what's more important, the envision of the change or the enforcement of the change? I really think that at the end of the day, it's our responsibility as creators to provoke different approach and different ideas. Um, because otherwise, you know, the other side that needs to create legislation, you know, won't know what to do. So I really think that this is our time to push really hard on our beliefs and be very persistent in order to, for that change to be accepted. Yeah, so as designers, of course, we do have that critical role to play, but there needs to be a balance between government regulations and design, and we are people who can envision those things. Um, and, but for it to actually come into effect, there needs to be a significant amount of change in, in that as aspect also. So. so impact. Impact is in the future. And impact through thought and change and approach and pitch. Um, I think we can take some questions from the audience, if anybody would like to speak to our creatives. One question over there. Yeah. Hi, I'm a designer and architect myself, and I'm, I'm wondering how you engage with your clients um, to really get them to the point to understand the importance in the project of sustainability, because I do think that your client is very much kind of defining the budget and how you can approach a project. So it works sometimes, but sometimes it just doesn't. And so I think then regulations come into play where a client needs to be sort of encouraged to, to work with a certain guidelines. But yeah, that's my question. Just share a few uh, experiences. Of course, of course, today we're sharing the fantastic aspect of our job is that everything seems to be easy, but we have to convince every day and we have to work with, uh, with the rules. Um, so I myself consider uh, that I don't pretend I can win every battle. Uh, so it means there are some compromise uh, all the time. Uh, but I think also the future is about, um, uh, how do you say, community, uh, community uh, uh, dialogue. If you bring everyone around the table, uh, uh, city stakeholders, uh, designers, and uh, users. 
uh, you define the parameters and you define the list of priorities. That's, that's what I, uh, I do. Uh, and among those priorities, uh, there are challenges with uh, the incapacities that we discussed about uh, uh, human rules that sometimes... Uh, but I think it's, it's also a good time now. Uh, I'm speaking for France, for example, uh, where today we can challenge those rules uh, if we bring uh, a really consistent, uh, sustainable approach in our design. Uh, those rules can be uh, re written uh, because there is a global uh, awareness of, uh, uh, as Tro was saying, that those rules are a bit old-fashioned sometimes and not corresponding to this super fast change that we're living in. Uh, so they also have a role to, uh, I think, propose uh, uh, new adaptations. Yeah. Um, so I think that uh, we all make decisions from two places, either from love or from fear. And uh, when we try to influence pe other people's decisions, we can also think you know, from which place that will come. Uh, I like to think that we should only operate from the place of love and not operate from the place of fear. And I think that this idea of sustainability is again kind of like, well, you know, you really should do this. That's the right thing to do. And it's, you know, if it feels like that, then it's not really authentic. So I, I, I think that, um, you know, one of the things that for me, I think, have proven themselves to work well is when you're when the idea when the conceptual integrity of the project is actually the biggest motivation of the project and it requires a certain things in order to practice that idea so it's kind of becomes the almost the insurance policy that it will be in the right way according to your to your approach yeah, I, I think that everybody is a bit tired of this like aspect of like, oh, but it is our responsibility, so let's not do it like this, let's do it like that. Like, let's find a different way, I think, to push this kind of agenda. So in, in coding and ingraining in the DNA of the project, the solution, which is then, you know, endemic and untranscendable. Is there any other questions before we bring this wonderful conversation to an end. I think our time is nearing. I hear, well, then thank you very much for participating.